Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this evening's webinar. I'm Francis Seeley from Global Net 21 and Enfield Voices. And this is one of the uh, many webinars we do where we look at people who are making a difference in their community. Now, one of the big problems that we face today is a problem of youth crime and knife violence. And we've seen a cre an increase in that and people are struggling everywhere to find solutions that are effective. Certainly in my area, Enfield, it's an area which has suffered from this problem as many areas have. Now, there are some people doing some really, really good things around this getting people together, getting communities together, and trying to get involved in early intervention. And one of these people is Lewis Bember, who has started a group and involved in others in starting a group called um, Live Your Life, Drop Your Knife. And now he's going to tell us about that and then tell us exactly what he's done. But before he, ha he does, let me say that if you are um, on this webinar system, you can put any comments or questions in the chat box on the right hand side and if you're watching the stream live on Facebook you can put comments uh, below the stream on the Facebook and we'll try to pick them up as, as we go along. Anyhow, you know, thank you for joining us Lewis and perhaps we could start by you telling us a little bit about yourself and why you got involved in the problem of knife crime. Um, so the reason I really got involved was um, I'd watched a young boy grow up um, most of his life. Um, someone who used to, you know, perhaps look up to our our group of friends when we were younger. And the, you know, when I, when we used to see Knife Crime on the TV, we never used to bat an eyelid, and it was like, you know, it's only something like happening in, in the capital, and that's what it really, that's all we really thought of it, up until when when Eddie was murdered. Um, it, it changed a lot of people's perspective mm -hmm. on violence. And knife crime and um, throughout the UK um, you know it's it affected our community so much that you know it's still it's still a raw topic today nearly eight months later and I think the work that we've done so far is, is only the tip of the iceberg really um, it take, it's gonna take a lot a lot lot more so I mean, this tragedy affected you and it affected members in your community. What did you sort of think straight away? I mean, was it, oh, I'm angry, or then did that move into, I've really got to do something about it? And what did you think of doing? I mean, to be honest, I was quite shocked. Um, I was quite shocked. I was quite angry that the fact that it had happened to someone that I knew um, and the fact that we as a nation have really just closed our eyes to it. and. For me, it was a sense of, well, what is actually getting done to stop knife crime? But it's becoming more and more, and obviously we need to be able to combat it in a way where we don't criminalise every single every single person that's involved in it because that's not what it takes. With that, that would just then cause issues in a further generation when they're parents, but they're all criminals as well. So it's, you know, we need to have a look at what ways we can from a community that's what that's why i got involved because we need to look at ways as a community in order to build that level of trust and relationship with the young the younger generation so was it you who started um love your life drop your knife or was that already in existence and you joined what happened what was a series of events um, so uh, eddie was murdered and then three four hours after i was like this is you know i'm gonna start like an online movement or something like I didn't know of any other knife campaigns or anything or what well, I never really paid any much much notice. So I made a Facebook group and Facebook page and I went I, I, fell, I went I went to bed and then I woke up the next morning and it had gone massive, like it had been shared over twelve hundred times within the space of like six hours and it, it just it just went it just went huge. So I was like, Well, I'm not gonna stop here then. So I emailed like a, a bunch of counsellors and I emailed the police and I got them all around the table. And I said to them, you know, what are you doing to combat knife crime? Because somebody's been murdered in our community and it's, you know, that's unacceptable. So what are you actually doing? And I, I said my ideas to the council and, and, and stuff and had people that thrown some ideas. And we were basically told by the council that we were too ambitious. Um, 
we wouldn't go very far because our ambitions were too high. Um, we we were too all over the place, and it, you know that kind of made me think. Well, hang on a minute. Who are you to tell me that? Like you don't know who I am. So it kind of made me more more determined to actually do something about it, and and you know, and, and possibly cause some some ruffle some feathers within the local council because it needed it needs to be done. Uh, local councils very often think that they're the only ones who can do things, but what happens is that they often don't do anything uh, that's substantial and they stop other people doing it. I mean, how did you get over that problem? Did you get them involved or did you just go ahead and said, we're going to do it on the basis of community and community involvement? That's basically it. So we don't have any involvement from the council whatsoever. The council, the, the council don't speak to us. Um, you know, you still kind of get that look, if you know what I mean. You still that sense of feeling, like when we've been to like the chambers, our local town hall and stuff. You still, you still kind of get that, that sense of the, the we're above you. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, and it, it sometimes it is quite daunting. But then I remember that they're, they're, they're there to council. That's their sole job is to council and govern. But they don't seem to do it in a, in a very orderly fashion. And I, I mean, are they doing anything in relation to youth crime and knife violence at all? Not as far as I'm aware. No, I think the only people really doing anything to do with knife crime in, in, in Holton is our group um, and Cheshire Police. Um, now, Cheshire Police have been very, 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 very supportive. Um, the type of relationship that we've got with them at the moment is like a first of its kind in the country so there's no, never been a relationship like it or a bond like it between a community organization and the police like that level of trust is there and the police are very aware that you know at times we we need to tell we, we, we you know at the end of the day we I, I personally say that i work with young people so there's that line that we have to be with the police obviously with trying to build up them relationships with young people um so the the police are really, really supportive, but then the council haven't. We haven't really had anything from them at all. But that that's interesting. You work with the police. The council are not very supportive. Um, they're probably not doing a great deal. Maybe ho holding the occasional public meeting, but not actually doing the sort of things that you think important. So, what did you do? You 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 did all this on Facebook. You got this tremendous response. You got people together. You formed a, a community interest company, didn't you, to start with in order to move it forward. Can you tell us about that? Well, that, that was one of the biggest nightmares. I've never, ever, ever dealt with companies. How, <laughs> I, I, honestly, if anyone, anyone who's watching who's never dealt with companies, how can you have to pay someone to do it? Honestly, not worth the headache. Um, basically, I wanted to secure something which was owned, but which was going to continually be owned by the community um, that people couldn't couldn't get rich off. Do you know what I mean? Like... I'm sick of looking at these charities and certain CEOs and big directors and board members are all getting millions of pounds worth of bonuses, but then they're still asking for, for money to go and help other people. And it's like, well, you know, you, you, you either do, you're either in that job because you, you, you really, really want to help people or you're in that job for the, the portfolio that comes around it. And for me, I wanted it to be owned by the community. So for making it a community, a community interest company, was one of the biggest aims for us. So you, you got it going and, and it's interesting what you said at the beginning. You said you didn't want a punitive approach where you treated everyone as criminals because that just passes it on to the next generation. So really you're into what some people call a public health or early intervention um, method of tackling this problem. Is that right? Yeah, so it's all about the intervention, but what we can't forget about is we can't we can't forget about the prevention the prevention now, which is you know where it comes in with like your your CBT, your cognitive behaviour therapies, and you know your out, your outreach work, and just generally being there for young people so they know that they have someone. I think that's the biggest thing. So, so when you say they have someone, what does that mean? I mean, you how do you sort of connect with young people who might be involved in knife crime and youth violence. I mean, how do you make that connection to get that early intervention going? It's all about building rapport. You know, it, one of the first things in sales that we teach you is to, to mirror your customer, but yet we don't see these organizations or authorities mirroring the, you know, 
the, the way that young people think or the way that young people act, then that doesn't necessarily mean acting out in the way a young person would. That means being on that young person's level. You know, that, like I say, it was one of the first things ever taught in sales is to mirror your customers. And if you can't mirror your customers, you can't sell. And it's all selling is all, all based on trust. So you have to build that trust up. It's the, you know, you can say, take the same principles that are used in business and use them to build relationships with people because at the end of the day, you can have a product, which is a person, or it could be a TV. And I think that's the biggest thing. So what we generally tend to do is to go out on a one-to-one -one basis in schools and outside outreach. And we generally just tend to speak to them as like the, like the, the people and we, we trust them and we respect them. And over time they, you know, you, you, know, we, you could kind of say we're like a professional friend. So, so I mean, with schools, you, you go into schools, so you have a relationship with schools, do you? Uh, which you, you, you work to, you work with school by school. Yeah, yeah. So um, we've recently launched our education program. I mean, our organisation's um, not even eight months old yet, and we've already gained a, um, a total reach of over two and a half million people. And we've been praised in the House of Parliament for the work that we've been that we've done in schools. Um, so today, just today, actually, we were uh, we were with a group that uh, 16 to 19 year olds that were potentially unemployed. Um, and it was all about getting them back into into work and out of that that lifestyle of potentially carrying a knife. Um, so you know there was five, five pupils in this in this class. So it's a really one to one deep engagement, and they're all actively engaged and building up that like that level of trust. Like two of the lads in there, we filmed with ITV a couple of months ago. So they knew us, so they instantly, we instantly had that level of respect. So we, there was no, there was no, I would say, if you go into a mainstream school where it's like, you know, you say, for instance, year nine, come on, be quiet, be quiet, blah, blah, blah. With these, they were actually, because we already had that level of respect and trust with them, they took on the information a lot quicker and a lot more easily. And it just works a lot better when you have that trust. So uh, w when you go in, you're obviously doing something which is quite important. That's giving them an alternative vision of their future. But, I mean, do you also go in, for example, and take people who have been affected by knife crime or ex-gang leaders and they talk to young people as well? So, we're, obviously, we, we, we tend not to try and reinvent the wheel. So we work um, hand in hand um, with an organisation called Holton Got Your Back which is um, run by a charity called Remedy, which is a restorative uh, youth justice service. And basically their service is for all those who have been affected by knife crime. Um, so obviously they're all trained professionals. So we work hand in hand with them to offer that support even when it's needed. But then because them young people trust us, if we were then to refer them to this organization, they would then potentially go on to you know, perhaps get the help they need because they trust where it's coming from. So, how imp I mean, that again is interesting. How important is the, a collaborative approach to what you do, knowing that you can't reinvent the wheel or you don't want to reinvent the wheel? You can't do it on your own. And so you work with others. For example, you work with Claire Cook, don't you, in Platform for Change and Sarah Atherton in the outreach uh, department of Everton Football Club. I mean, how important is it to bring these people together so that you can provide almost a total service, even though you don't have the council involved, you're doing what the council should be doing, but you're doing it collaboratively in the community. Um, I think collaboration, it, it's, that's, the key to, that's the key to fighting knife crime, it's the key to fighting mental health, it's the key to fighting poverty. Working together is the key for, for most of this country's problems. And it's all about working, to, working together, building, it's like just for instance, our relationship with the police is I'll have an idea, the police will go, well, that's a brilliant idea, but what about if you added this on top? And then you've got someone who's very high up in the police telling you that your idea is brilliant and they back it, which automatically gets the support, do you know what I mean? The support around it. So it's it, it, working collaboratively, it, 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 it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. So 
your advice to people is not try and get arrogant and believe that you're the total answer, but to work with everyone who's got an answer and bring that together? Well, I personally don't believe that it's down to arrogance. I think it's a competition for money. I actually think it's down to a competition for people get scared of working together because they think that if they work with an organisation and that organisation's, say for instance, reports are better, the analytics are better, then that organisation then is fearful of having their money taken away from them and giving them to somebody else. Well, that's an important point. And I've seen that elsewhere on, that, on project after project. People won't work together because they're afraid that they lose out. How do you work together then and convince everyone that that won't happen, that working together is to the mutual benefit of all? Well, at the moment, we're obviously working with statutory organisations such as the police. Um, you know, we've, we're currently working um, alongside the Youth Justice Service, so that's who we were teaching for today. Um, we ran the workshop for the Youth Justice Service. Um, so it's these organisations are already in place. So we're just saying, you know, nobody's an expert in life crime. You know, I'm not an expert, and, you know, the people who are running these other work, no, no an expert, because this is, is not something that, that you can be an expert on. It's all hypotheticals. You can't judge something that you can't see coming. So it's it's all working on a hypothesis basis of how you're going to react and let's let's face it every single child is different every single child learns in a different way every single child has a different mindset it it needs all those different bodies and all those different organizations to come together for the knowledge the skill and the resources so you go into a school um, you, you work, I guess, with youth clubs as well, local colleges, and maybe sports clubs. Maybe you can tell us about that. But then you talk to them, they get you gain their trust, and then you can begin to work them, with them one-to-one. -one. And if you find they have a specific need, you then can refer them on to an area that you feel that can do the job best. Is that how you try to develop your holistic approach? Yeah, absolutely. And that's exactly it. It's all about it's like just since we work with one college, which is a training provider, and we started off going in there just on a lunchtime basis and having a cup of tea and chat with them for three, four months, because that's how long it took us to actively engage with them with with that group of group of group of youths. You know, it took four months of going in once a week and having a cup of tea with them. If we were to go in and do a nice time workshop with them, with them young young people who we didn't know they would not take any of that information in they wouldn't engage with it they wouldn't be honest they wouldn't be open to actually being aware of the effects we believe it, it, it needs that holistic approach but also that's an interesting point because when you talk about your violence everybody's wanting the quick fix they want to get it sort of sorted by tomorrow but it doesn't happen like that, does it? Trust takes time to build up and getting a solution is a long-term process. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I believe that out outreach is one of the key the keyest parts in 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 solving knife crime. And the only reason I believe outreach is one of the only ways to solve knife crime is because the kids that are carrying knives and the kids that are involved in gang culture aren't going to willingly participate in a youth, club, youth group or a youth club. So we actively need to be going out and seeking these young people. If they run away from us every time for six months, then so be it. You know, that's what it takes. They need that. They, you know, we've got to remember that 90% of people that are, in, well, sorry, not 90%, uh, you know, a, a large percentage of people that are involved in my crime are from broken families. So they don't particularly have a particular role model you know, they may be, they may be selling drugs and being involved in life crime just simply for the fact that they're trying to put food on the table for their mum, but their mum doesn't know what they're doing. So there's a whole, a whole reason of factors, and, and obviously that then relates to that um, that whole family needs support and not just that one young, one young person. So what organisations are out there that can support that whole family rather than just you? So it it, it, it seems like it's going to take a long time and that's because it is going to take a long time because this is not like i say it's not it's not something you can we can solve overnight it's not something that the police can arrest their way out of and with our just criminal justice system at the moment 
it, nobody's scared. So you also work with families, do you? I mean, you, you, you realise that a problem that you may face on a young person comes from the environment which they're in. And if you don't address that environment, you're not going to address that problem. So, I mean, you're not equipped in your organisation to deal with that sort of family advice, but you do have organisations that can. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, like I say, we're not reinventing the wheel. There's plenty of organisations out there at the moment. And yes, some of them are scrapped, but some of the smaller ones aren't. You know, there's always them small local organisations that can help people. You know, it's not all about the big brand charities and this, that and the other. There's always groups and support services in your local community. And really, it's just about networking to find out what happens, where it happens and what activities take place. So getting a social network map of your area is important. The other thing, you mentioned youth clubs. I mean, lots of people think, and I know our old council locally does think, that if you put money into youth clubs, you're doing something to solve the problem. But you're not, are you, unless you have all that backup that you give. You follow that by going in there. You make that one-to-one -one engagement with a person. You then refer them to other people who can help. Just putting money in is not enough, is it? No. So... Putting money in is obviously a start, but then you need the right people to run to run, you know, these youth clubs, these activities. And you know, in my in, in my town, there's one youth organisation, and there are drugs and alcohol misuse service. They're not an active youth provision, like a youth provision, in them. You know, art clubs and association. It's the the sole aim is 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 for drugs and alcohol misuse. So they don't focus in, although they do try to to help young people with other issues that they may face. It's not obviously a fully inclusive, um, you know, it's not fully inclusive for that young person because they suffer with quite a lot. And even though the organizations that are out there doing it, you know, are trying to do a, a fantastic job, we've got to ask ourselves, the people that are running these huge zones, do they have, do they have the right management skills? Can young people relate to them? You know, it's all about being able to have that relationship of, you know, and sometimes it doesn't matter on age. Like, say, for instance, I know a, a lady that's much, much, much older, and she got a fantastic relationship with some young people. So it doesn't matter what age you are or who you are. It depends if you can manage and, and be relatable to, 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 to kids. So, so if that's important, you know, whether you can be, as you call it, relatable to kids, a bottom-up a bottom approach is a lot better than a council top-down approach where they don't have that isn't it that you're actually building the relationships with the workers that you work with as well as the people and you're building relationships with the community whereas a top-down council approach could be rather sort of anemic yeah absolutely and you know it's it's quite sad to think that that's the way that you know there's no planning for the future it's just well we're going to act now with what with what's happening now and it's like well if you invested now and then you wouldn't have to deal with this problem in 10 years in 15 years it would be a lot a lot, a lot you know it's like when you go to, when you when we take a look back to to like for instance when when my mum and dad were kids they were it was all the rave scene and it was all ecstasy and acid and this that and the other but if we take a, take a look at the kids these days it's xboxes uh, you know and, and weed it's it's we've got a you know all right to solve the problem, it's multiple issues. So for one, we need to readdress drug policy. And it's not just to say to legalise it, it's to, to take that control and that power away from those who are harnessing it and they're, they're ruining people's lives from it. And obviously that's where most young people are, are failing and falling victim to is them grooming and county lines. So, I mean, in order to do that you've got to get the community on your side don't you so do you get involved in public awareness to try and get people to understand some of the things you've just been saying yeah absolutely so say for instance my 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 uh, one of the other guys that works on our on our team she's a you know she's got six kids do you know what i mean and it she's relatable because she's got kids she's a mom she's a parent do you know what i mean she's you know, out of the six kids, one of them's one of them's a bad, and none of the others are. So it, it just goes to say that it's not doesn't necessarily always boil down to parenting. There's other factors, other issues, and that's why it takes 
that collaborative approach, that building relationships, so you can get to know that young person in order to, like you said, build them relationship because you need different people from different backgrounds because people have different issues and face different. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I mean, that, 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 that's important. So the relationship you try to create is not like a social worker-client relationship. It's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Absolutely. And like I say, it's, I, I, I quite often say the term professional friend because in a way we are a friend, but professionally because they re we, we expect them to reside in us as friends would. So it, it literally is all about that trust. Have you been able to measure at all the effectiveness of what you do? Have you seen an outcome that you can say, right, we've been successful? We have seen, um, uh, uh, just, well, after Eddie's murder, um, now obviously this can't be measured in any way because nobody nobody took, took any, any results, but there obviously was a lot less reports of people carrying knives, that, you know, you could say that down to the mm -hmm. fact that we were in people's faces or the fact that, you know, that murder you know, actually shocked a lot of young people. Um, now, we've obviously been out with various TV crews and et cetera with outreach work and speaking to young people. And one of the biggest things that young people said is, you know, we, they were asked, you know, did what did you ever think, you know, that carry a knife could have this, this amount of comfort, this amount of impact? And... The answer that we that we most commonly got was they had no idea that it could actually do this type of thing. It, you know, it, they thought it was just a knife, and that was it. And now the whole community, the whole town, you know, we're only a small town, only seventy thousand people live in Runcorn. You know what I mean? And and so you you know you, you think the whole community basically knows what you're doing now. I mean, you started small, but you have got that support that's necessary. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's like, just for instance, we, we, we were probably six, seven weeks old and we were invited to like a knife crime workshop uh, in a neighbouring town. And we walked in and there was a load of police sat to our left and, you know, we kind of just walked over to the other side. And we kind of heard them saying in the background, oh, that's that. They're them people from Runcorn who are doing that. So it was like, they knew about who we were in different towns before we were even anywhere as what we are as big now so i think a lot of companies a lot of people are, are very aware of the work that we're you know that we're doing so if, if another locality wanted to do something because they've got the problem which meant most many well probably most localities do now uh and they wanted to do something to make a difference in the community what advice would you give them the advice that i'd give them is find the right person to do it now, this person doesn't have to be a prominent figure. You know, this person's just got to care enough about wanting change, you know, and if that is you watching and you, you're passionate about wanting change but don't know where to start, you know, there's plenty of, you know, you can message us, you know, all I done was start a Facebook page and emailed a load of people from the council and got them around the table. And that, look where we are now. We're, we've got a, a weekly reach of quarter of a million people We've engaged with over 1,500 kids, you know, and I know a, a lot of other you know, campaigns may possibly engage with a lot more kids, but we're, we're, we're only just getting started. I'm not a teacher, you know, none of my colleagues are teachers, and it's, it's just sort of a learning curve for us. So we've managed to do what we've done with little to no money as well. So we've been actively engaged with 1,500 kids and we've probably spent less than £500. Yes, we've done it for nothing, out of the goodness of our hearts. And yes, you know, we're not going to be able to do it forever. So we do need to find a way to make it, you know, a business sustainable. And that doesn't necessarily make it mean making money on, on the knife campaign. We can look at other, other ways so young people can benefit from, from, from having that support, you know, within the community. Isn't there? Isn't that a message? I mean, lots of people say oh, we, we can't do it unless we've got the money. We've got the, you know, nasty governments, nasty local authorities who don't put money in. But your message is, you know, that may be true, but that doesn't stop you doing things. You've got to start. And if you find the right people, you can do it. How much does it cost you to go to a meeting? How much does it cost you to put something on Facebook? You know, if you've got a printer at home and you've got a couple of spare hours, I'm pretty sure you can put together a, a little lesson of your own experience, you know, 
And I'm not talking about people every t- every Tom, Dick, and Harry doing this. I'm talking about people who've been affected from knife crime. Um, you know, they can they know how it feels. They can express what you know how it is, and it's all about getting that story out there and learn. It, life life's a big learning curve anyway. Okay, so, you know, we've sort of come to the end of the half an hour now, but clearly you're doing a fantastic job. You've involved a lot of people um, and you're making a difference. Now, if people wanted to find out more about what you've done and learn from what you've done, how do they get in touch with you? Um, so you can email us on info at liveyourlifedropthenife.co.uk. Um, you can visit our Facebook page, or, uh, which is Live Your Life Drop the Knife or our Twitter, which is Drop That Knife. Uh, drop us a message or send us an email and we'll get back to you. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Lewis. I mean, that was really, really interesting. And it does demonstrate that, you know, you can make a difference uh, it, when you're not a social worker, you're not on the council, you're in the community, you're an ordinary person there and you can start something and you can get other people involved. And that's, that's really great. I mean, we're going to do some more webinar interviews on this with a number of other organizations doing similar things to you so people can see that there is hope, there is a way of, of moving forward. So thanks for doing this. And um, I hope we can share this uh, interview and the work that you're doing to as many people as possible. So thank you for doing this, Lewis. No worries. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, well, we'll, um, we'll end this uh, webinar interview now. Oh, my God.